Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this session. We will today in this session talk about the European Union in Health and the role of a European Council for Health Research. I am Karim Sipido from Karim Leven, and I have with me Laurent de Vos from the French Academy of Science. And we are both members of the Scientific Panel for Health, which is an advisory group under Horizon 2020. And much of what uh, we will share with you, in, especially in the introduction and the later discussion, comes from a consensus document that was written by this group. However, I want to point out that what I am presenting to you and what we are discussing is the opinion of the panel members and should not be taken as an official position of the Commission. We are speaking against the background of one of the serious health challenges to the world. COVID-19 has amplified the call for a European health union and for a coordination platform for health. We have been confronted with the, the strengths of the system as we saw in calling for EU funding for COVID, but also a lot of the limitations that we have in the system. And one of the major limitations is fragmentation. Fragmentation in competences in health, but also fragmentation in research. And the commission has answered to the challenge of COVID, as I said, with research funding, but also with future programs. But looking towards the future, we should be aware of the limitations we have come to confront now. And this is also stated in a letter that was written to President von der Leyen, uh, an initiative of members of the European Parliament, supported by stakeholders, the EU Health Coalition, which is a big platform bringing together health professionals, scientists, industry, but also the Biomet Alliance, professional organizations, and the academies of medicine in Europe. The letter addressed the president and said, we are happy to read that the European Commission will launch a new standalone health program and that Horizon Europe will be reinforced to fund vital research. However, there is a missing link. There is no clear leadership for health and health research in Europe. And so any proposals should, incl should include a mechanism that can design and implement a roadmap for health research, linking knowledge to health policies. The alternative fragmentation prevents high quality initiatives from being realized. And the duplication leads to waste of much needed funding, funding and opportunities for enhancing synergies. Now, in the discussion in the past days towards the European Health Union, it has been asked whether EU treaties are hampering implementation. Are we against the limits of what the European Union can do? It is well known that health competences are mostly at the level of financing is at the level of at the level of member states. Yet the EU also stands to implement and maintain a high level of human health protection. So there is a commitment and a responsibility to health. And there is definitely an EU research policy. Now, EU research policies have, from the beginning, mostly been acts towards strengthening industry, towards innovation and promoting the economy. But it is free to promote all research activities that are deemed necessary for policy, including, therefore, health. Now, EU research funding is quite powerful. We are all aware of, especially in health, excellent programs, such as in rare diseases, the IMI programs. But it is important to keep in mind that most of the funding for in the pie chart on the left, public funding sits predominantly in the member states, the blue. On the other hand, EU is the prime financer for multinational cross-sectoral collaboration, which is what we need 
for health. But to address this fragmentation, this was one of the reasons that the uh, panel proposed in its paper, Building the Future of Health Research, a proposal for European Council for Health Research. It should develop an EU-wide vision and strategy for health research across sectors and borders. It should work for more synergy, more cohesive, better aligned funding programs and initiatives, continuity in a long-term vision. And it should also create visibility and leadership in Europe. If you ask where is health research in the United States, people will cite you the NIH. They will cite you advisory bodies. We also need very important more equality between our European countries. And in a way, all of this proposal is not really so absolutely breaking with tradition. It is actually a building up of what was started many years ago. We have gone from individual collaboration. We must now come to a comprehensive policy and synergy of programs. So on the agenda for today, for the panel, we have three themes that we will talk about, starting from lessons from talking about synergies between health research and health policies. And uh, each time the topic will be introduced by uh, someone, member of the panel of health, Susanna Palkonen, and then uh, joined with uh, Dr. Rottingen, and Laurent Legos joined with uh, by Christine Chamien. And then we will talk about building durable leadership in health research, introduced by Hans Hofstraff, Vice President Phillips, and joined with uh, Professor Wiesler from the Helmholtz Association, Professor Griffin and Professor Priest. And I will end with some closing words. So let's start with the first theme. And unfortunately, I uh, must tell you that uh, Susanna Palkonen was unable to join us today in person because of health problems. She asked me to share her messages with you for this session. Susanna Palkonen is uh, chair and member of the board of the IFA, a European Federation of Allergy and Airways Diseases Patient Associations, and she is also the chair of the Patient Access Partnerships. At IFA, the group works to inform, prevent, and care for allergy and respiratory diseases. And so this is what is needed in order to help being a patient caring and preventing for children. All of these pillars need research, current and new research that is implemented and prioritized with determination. I also, on her behalf, include here a message from the Patient Access Partnership, who already in 2019 asked for better coordination and visibility leadership for health in the European Commission, asking for a vice president for health who would help to implement better policies for better health. Now, COVID has dismally uncovered the consequences of a lack of proactive structures that would ensure equal access to materials and treatments. And this is a very important aspect from the patient's view that was also uh, her team, when we summarize what the panel has put forward as goals and aims for the next year. We need health research for societal value and impact. And inequalities in Europe are a, a problem that has become very visible now and that needs to be addressed, needs to be addressed in the health research policies. Here you see data from Eurostat. These are different countries. There is more than 50 years inequality in life expectancy across the EU. It was a theme from uh, one of the workshops. And the message is clear, no European Union without addressing the health need. Healthcare may not be a prime consequence. Well, excuse me, healthcare cannot be, a, it's not a prime competence of the union, but it could be not be separated from health research that can help to address mechanisms to reduce health inequality. 
and the patient organization from Romania said it very clearly, solutions need to be comprehensive, patient-centered and supported by an EU roadmap. And Mikhail Shoshka emphasized we need support systems that are bigger than individual member states. Finally, she asked to share the message that we need to focus on health and health promotion with a lifespan view. We need a long-term vision. We should not just think about research investments as single projects investments. We need beyond the, the knowledge, the implementation with tailored interventions and research and health promotion and prevention should also be translated into policy. And finally, research should be with and for patients and public benefit. And with those messages, I hand over uh, the word to Dr. Rottingen from the Norwegian Research Council. He also is very well placed to give us a broader perspective, being a, a founding executive the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations, board member of the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, and a member of the Consultative Expert Working Group on Research. Please, Dr. Ottinger. Thank you, Karin, um, and thanks for the opportunity to, to be a part of this uh, important panel. Then I'm trying to share my slides. Um, you can see the slides? Yeah, very good. So I've been uh, asked to reflect. Excuse me. Excuse me, we don't see your slides yet. I think you still have to hit a presentation. Do other people see your slides? No. Now you see, see them? Uh, we still, now we see them. Yes, we're fine. Yeah. So I will first reflect on some experiences from the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Um, as we know, the, uh, this schematic or diagram is a, a, a diagram from a paper in Lancet early on in the epidemic. Uh, at that stage, we didn't know really what the future would bring. But the different sort of potential for epidemic spread, so the red curve the epidemic is uh, exponentially growing outside the control of the healthcare system capacities. The green curve demonstrating a potentially flattening of the curve with, uh, within the boundaries of the health system's capacities. And then the turquoise curve indicating strong measures. Uh, and in many ways, this measure has been used in most European countries, but then a risk for a, a resurgence of the, of the epidemic, a second wave in the fall. And, more or less, that's where we are, as we know, with 50,000 cases reported in France just the last day, um, and, and the pandemic is really back. And then I just tried to transpose this epidemic curve into the, the, the normal innovation chain of biomedical innovation, because we need, need new tools, we need new diagnostics, new therapeutics, and new vaccines when a new uh, epidemic with unknown origin starts. And as we all know, Biomedical innovation takes time. In the median time for development of a vaccine is eight years uh, from first clinical trial to actually uh, approval. Uh, so how do we reconcile these different uh, time frames? A very fast moving epidemic and a biomedical innovation system that is solid uh, but takes time. Uh, of course, we can act faster, and I think we have demonstrated that before. We demonstrated that during the Ebola outbreak of the uh, West Africa, where we managed actually to, to for in 11 months, uh, start the first uh, patient in a phase one trial in Switzerland and in London, and then actually have efficacy data 11 months later from uh, the ring vaccination trial in Guinea, which led to the establishment of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. This is a curve. Uh, a diagram demonstrating the uh, the many clinical trials ongoing on COVID-19. This is uh, uh, before the summer, more than uh, 1,400 different clinical trials. My main point here is that there are too many trials and they are too small. They really do not give us the necessary evidence. Uh, and in many ways, there are only two trials that have really brought um, inclusion at scale so that we can look at mortality. And that's the UK-based recovery trial, where a large proportion of admitted hospital 
patients have been recruited into a clinical trial. They have recruited more than 12,000 patients. And then it's the World Health Organization solidarity trial uh, uh, now recruiting also more than 12,000 patients. And of course, Europe participating to a large extent, partly directly in the trial and partly through the discovery trial, which is uh, now a part of the solidarity collaboration. My point of showing this is that we can deliver faster research and innovation in health if we collaborate, but we need to manage it. And actually there has been too much experimental use of repurposed drugs during the epidemic early on, not an outside trials. And there has not been sufficient management and leadership at the European level to try to coordinate. Uh, we are better now, but I think we lost the first wave uh, as a, an opportunity to learn from our patient care. Uh, there are now some emerging trends, I would say, internationally in health uh, and health research. Uh, we see an increasing digitalization of the health system. Um, and of course, the pandemic has actually uh, accelerated that transition. We have more access to health data than ever. We have the opportunities of using big data analysis. We see the opportunities of open science and open innovation and more collaboration. And we see even more a digitalization more broadly of the scientific enterprise. And I think all of these trends will uh, be an opportunity for improving the health research system of Europe. Um, because the health research system, and now I'm almost sort of in the next phase or next part of the, the, the panel session, but I'm I'm very strong believer of the need to think holistically about the health research system being linked to the health system and that they need to be uh, a part of the overall knowledge system for health. The challenge is that the national health research system capacities will all, always be limited when it comes to scope and scale. They will always be uh, able to only address some of the key priorities of the national health system. And they will then need to rely on uh, other countries' uh, capacities um, through what is produced by other countries' researchers. So the interplay between the national health research system, the global health research system, and the national health system is something that we can make work much better as a holistic knowledge system in Europe. Uh, so my point is, and my main message is that by bringing now the new um, capacities of digitization, big data, open science, uh, and actually covering all of the aspects of the knowledge needs of the health system, we can do better collectively in Europe. But we then need to collaborate both between the research capacities and the health system capacities within countries, as well as between countries and at the European level. Um, so my main message is we need stronger international collaboration. Uh, many of the decisions we need to take, and in particular in the crisis situations, they are collective and collaborative decisions. Uh, and I think the pandemic has demonstrated that. And to, to make such decisions, we need institutional structures and capacities to do so. Um, it is a challenge when health is the responsibility of individual states, but I think the research system is an international system. Uh, the researchers in the COVID-19 response have really demonstrated the interest and willingness to collaborate outside their own boundaries, outside their own uh, borders. Uh, and I think that is a growing opportunity now moving forward also for the European system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rottingham. With the this, I would like to hand over the chair to Professor Laurent de Gauss. Thank you very much, Karen. Now we move to the health research and health policy. And uh, just following the basic research uh, conducted by the European uh, uh, Research Council, ERC, research for health starts as a stage of uh, proof of concept in order to obtain new technologies, uh, drug, devices, uh, and procedures from bench to bedside and from bedside to bench. 
and health research aims to improve healthcare for individuals until personalized medicine, focusing on the effectiveness and promote the public health, including prevention, focusing on the safety of poor population. And digitalization of health and research, collect of big data, algorithm, artificial intelligence, deep learning, link individual and collective health research. Modify dramatically our models and oblige to have a common European sources, common European research and common European platforms. Even more telemedicines over countries open new avenues for healthcare and need also common studies uh, assessing this type of practice. The story of COVID-19 that we discovered that, that we have been shown previously shows a dramatic issue when coordination, collaboration, and common strategy between European countries are missing. 1476 trials. What well, that means? The fragmentation of healthcare research by disease, by project, by multiple sources of funding, by the dispersion of the forces demonstrates the obvious need for a European Council. We cannot continue to drive the research without clear, common, synergistic strategy and common actions for a better, safer, faster, and easier healthcare and health. May I refer now uh, to some examples explaining the role of health research for health policies and the need of European vision. First, uh, health technology assessment use comparative effectiveness research for reimbursement and pricing. The research on comparison between technologies in real life could be managed in common, as it was suggested as the European uh, Network on Health Technology Assessment, UNIT HTA as well as uh, by the scientific panel for us. While the reimbursement and pricing themselves will be still defined by the countries themselves, but uh, comparative effectiveness research could be in common. We need also common agreement and rules on new methodologies. In fact, technology are today combined several drugs for epigenetic engineering, devices coated by drugs, companion markers for drugs. Several technology were not previously considered such as the med applications on smartphones, telemedicine, algorithms, artificial intelligence, and new types of trials emerge and are proposed such as the basket trials on, in oncology, focusing on the mutation of a tumor, whatever is the organ. And furthermore, in the perspective of fighting against inequalities in Europe, that we discussed previously, we need research on guidelines for good practice in Europe and European indicators. That means some research on indicators and guides. Public health is often forgotten and compartmented. Research on prevention, including vaccines, campaigns, and sociology of resistance. Epidemiology fights against toxic alcohol, tobacco, alimentation, salt, fat, sugar, addiction, agriculture, pollution, road accident, climate, research and action for collective health at the European level need a common dialogue between people working on health research and people working on social research. It is today obvious that we need a concerted forces and intelligence on health research in Europe, integrating all type of disease, all domain of health and healthcare in only one council. The council mission is a first step forward a comprehensive body, however limited to a disease. Christine Schulman, board member of the council mission, will develop an example. This Professor Christine Chomian is professor of hematology in Paris, Paris University. She was previously director of research of the French Agency on Cancer. Thank you, Christine, for, you, for sharing your experience.
Thank you uh, very much, Laurent, for this uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Karen Cipido. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, the topic of today is uh, very timely. And so I will share to you some of my slides to help me through uh, my talk. Let's get this running. Should be running. Right, there it is. Uh, so as Laurent said, I am vice chair of the Mission Cancer Board, which is a Horizon Europe uh, mission. And therefore I have been involved uh, in this mission driven approach of the Horizon Europe framework program for research and innovation. It's a novel concept of research and innovation to bring health and research together in a more visible manner for the EU citizen. The Horizon Europe mission uh, is in fact uh, very much, um, let's say, oriented by documents which have been published and you have uh, the, uh, the first document which was published in 2018. Uh, there are documents which have been requested by uh, the European Union and they have been brought forward by Professor Mariana Matsukato. So the goal of Horizon Europe missions, as you see here, is to give direction to European research and innovation in solving society's pressing challenges and produce tangible results. It therefore needs to involve citizens and stakeholders more closely in setting research priorities. But we will see not only, we need policy actions. And these will lead to equal access for everyone in Europe for the best of European research, innovation, resources, and of course, global know-how. So five Horizon Europe missions have been launched last year. They are all linked to well-being and health, but only one is directly linked to health, which is the mission on cancer. All missions were asked to give uh, their feedback after one year's work uh, during the European Research and Innovation Days last uh, month in September. And so we were able to, as you see here on the, uh, on the diagram, uh, hand over our report to Commissioner Maria Gabriel. The cancer mission uh, reports is in fact the input of not only the board members and the assembly members which are part of the mission board, but a very strong consultancy. And as you see, since May of 2020, we have met and seen uh, more uh, stakeholders than I ever imagined I could see in such a small time. And of course, considering uh, the current uh, crisis as all these meetings were, of course, uh, in remote. The cancer mission report, therefore, that we have given to Commissioner Gabriel includes inputs from a wide network of experts and organizations. You can see on the right that we have met with ministries of research and health and economics and ministries of education in all the 27 member states all the board members are ambassadors for one or two countries of the member states. We have held meetings with citizens, patients and caregivers in outline on also uh, in, uh, in meetings and you can see all the countries we have seen on the left. The citizen engagement events were done in the national language. There were also meetings with stakeholders in the national language or in English and we also had uh, focus groups of citizens and stakeholders bringing together many e Europeans together, even though the language was in English. We also had meetings uh, with the uh, academic and private sector advocacy group from the 27 member states. We had numerous meetings with members of the European Parliament. And of course, uh, it was very important for us to have continuous meetings uh, with the representative of the ministries, as, as I've said. So thanks to all these open and transparent discussions, we now believe that the mission cancer is the mission of all and not just the board members. We now together have a common target 
And this target, as you can see here in the roof of this, uh, I don't know, Greek temple, but I think Laurent will criticize my uh, architectural uh, knowledge. Well, at least in this roof, you can see that we have a common target, which is by 2030, more than 3 million lives will be saved, living longer and better. I will just uh, mention that these very precise uh, data uh, is because the mission has to have a very quantifiable and measurable in time target. So by 2030, more than 3 million lives saved, living longer and better. So to reach this, and as you can see, this is a really health target. To reach this health target, the Mission Cancer Report defined five intervention areas and recommendations for research and innovation actions that need to make conquering cancer a mission possible. So the five intervention areas are summarized here. We have the three pillars prevent what is preventable, optimize diagnostics and treatment, support quality of life for cancer patients, for patients surviving after cancer, for patients or citizens who know that they are at risk of cancer, and of course, all their carers. These three pillars, as you can see, lean on a common support which is very much linked to research, which is understand. We cannot improve what we do not understand. So for each of these pillars, there's a, there is a very strong research and innovation program. What we also believe, and I heard already in the previous speakers, what is important for all of us, all these uh, four interventions reach out to a common fifth intervention which is to ensure equitable access uh, to all for care and for research. In line with the mission-oriented approach, we have designed recommendations to be able to link actions for us to reach this goal of conquering cancer. The 13 recommendations can be consulted, but what mostly is important is, as you can see, there are all citizen and patient centered. For us, it's crucial to answer the needs of citizens and patients and to have the engagement of patients and citizens for the actions to be implemented and their results visible for the needs that they have wished. Of course, as you can see, even though we lean on Horizon Europe and research and innovation, we have to work with the existing networks, whether the existing European networks, the national and regional structures, which in each country fight against cancer. And as you know, we now have with the new European Commission, the European Beating Cancer Plan, which with, with which we will work, of course, in synergy. However, and I will finish because I think it's, it's the most important and probably linking to today's topic. What is important is that we have the engagement of all the stakeholders which are involved to cure cancer and to conquer cancer. And this is where the true change needs to be done. A true understanding by all stakeholders that the transformation of cancer culture has occurred in the last decade is a necessity. Cancer is no longer just one disease. Cancer is more than 200 different diseases. Each cancer patient is unique and each cancer patient's need is different. Therefore, research should now, for example, provide at the same time evidence of drug efficacy, but also toxicity. Research should also provide strong evidence for drug reimbursement and not wait 10 years after the clinical trials to ask for data for reimbursement. We need to have specific data on long-term survival and mental and clinical side effects 
so that insurers are able to be able to help cancer patients and cancer survivors. These are just a few examples. But then all these stakeholders should be allowed to describe the type of research that they need, the level of evidence that they require to be able to make decisions. And this is of course necessary at all member states level, as you know, all member states have their way of dealing with health. However, there's always a very positive aspect to everything. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that health systems adapt rapidly to changing circumstances and that they can build strong collaborations across sector and most importantly, across borders. Cross sector and cross member state collaboration was underscored in the document that you have here on the right, written by, by Mariana Matsukato, which is governing missions in the European Union. We need cross sector collaboration. We need cross member state collaboration to make sure that research actions and results are implemented for the benefit of the health of all EU citizens. And so I will conclude by saying that this has been the very first year of consultation and work of the Mission Cancer Board, but we still have seven more years to be able to continue the work. I hope therefore that these inputs will give you insights on how to move forward together to link health and research more efficiently in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine, for your talk. Very clear. And just uh, telling us that the research is the basis of the health and, and conquering the cancer. So now we move to Hans Ostra to take uh, over the session. Hans. May I just make a general remark to all the people who are uh, participating and watching this uh, webinar. We will collect all questions uh, by the end of the presentations for a panel discussion. Thank you very much. Please have. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Karin, and uh, happy to, uh, to continue with uh, the presentation. Uh, and also happy to, um, to uh, introduce uh, the uh, members of um, the panel in the, the next uh, session. Um, I will give a short introduction and then uh, I'm very much looking forward to the contribution of Professor Wiesler of the Helmholtz Association, um, which uh, I think will um, really give an example on how we can join forces across multiple sites in a successful way. Um, followed by a reflection by um, uh, Professors Griffin and Pries, um, members um, uh, of um, also organizations uh, that uh, I think can have valuable contributions. And I must say, I really already liked the contributions that we heard before, uh, because they really um, put emphasis on the things that we need going forward. In the uh, scientific panel for health, um, we focused on health research, but health research in several ways. And particularly with the goal to use research to boost translation, validation, implementation, and sharing. And those messages also came from the uh, previous contributions. Because research without implementation, without addressing real needs, um, of course, um, misses the final outcome and goal, uh, which is, of course, that everyone benefits. And multi and transdisciplinary research, particularly in healthcare, is absolutely needed. In order to do this, uh, we have to, um, to have a dialogue and uh, to translate information and evidence supported by the research into policies and implementation at national and at EU level. Um, going forward, um, of course, very good to see that in the communication to us all, uh, in the introduction to the World Health Summit, this has been very much been uh, also uh, supported by Ursula von der Leyen, who says 
that the EU is ready to step up and take more responsibility in the health sector, which I think is certainly what is needed to uh, uh, scale up and to address the uh, fragmentation that already was mentioned by the previous speakers. And particularly in Europe, of course, we have the uh, uh, challenge that on the one hand, the uh, national or even sometimes regional um, governments are responsible for the health system, the delivery of health to their citizens, uh, but also for all um, quality and regulatory reimbursement and other very important implementation um, sites. At the same time, of course, there is the EU that can really bring the countries together and accelerate uh, scaling up, um, accelerate um, European uh, implementation and competitiveness, but also uh, accelerate European wide introduction of innovations. In order to do that, uh, obviously, we have uh, to navigate uh, the complexity of regulations in health research and the complex path towards implementation. And they're uh, reaching out to all the stakeholders, uh, research organizations, academia, but also the uh, private sector in delivering the um, available solutions and society and policy makers really bring us all together and not to forget the patient, the civic society where we started off with Susanna Palcon. A very big opportunity I think we have, and it already was emphasized before, is the opportunity to leverage data and digital health solution. By using digital health solutions, we can democratize information, we can democratize insights, we can scale up in terms of size and um, number of uh, patients uh, to be addressed. We can also uh, address the uh, and support the equitable access to quality care. It enables us also to empower citizens and patients to take uh, a stake themselves. And I think digital solutions uh, really is um, an opportunity that we need to capture uh, all of us in, in, in addition to support learning, education, and coaching as well. COVID-19 already has been uh, addressed uh, by Professor Rottingen. Um, it provides the challenge and the, the coronavirus does not recognize the uh, European or whatever borders. Uh, we addressed that in the, the paper that was um, uh, also introduced uh, by uh, Karin. Uh, and really there um, in the number of trials that and the information that we can put together and the almost 1500 trials, what if we can scale it up? Uh, but of course we have to recognize that in introducing digital solutions there's a number of challenges that need to be addressed in order to really be able to uh, to join forces uh, and uh, do what is best for us for our citizens and our patients interesting enough and uh, this is a very busy slide i recognize that uh, based on the uh, go fair initiative that actually was taken by uh, Germany, France, as well as uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, we are able to really provide the boundary conditions uh, to uh, provide um, sharing of data in an, uh, uh, a very well and well uh, organized manner. Um, the Vodan network, the virus outbreak data network that has been started, uh, actually provides both the technical infrastructure and the data uh, boundary conditions, the boundary and, and, and data needs um, to provide an opportunity uh, to really benefit from the data and share them. And interesting enough, um, we see that while the headquarters um, actually is located at the Leiden University Medical Center, that at the moment, most of the contributing institutes that join forces to work together uh, are located in Africa and Asia, taking the lead in really sharing their data, sharing their information and uh, moving uh, forward uh, in order to address this uh, huge challenge. And I think this is an example where joining forces actually built bottom up, we are able to really accelerate this kind of research 
to the benefit of all. Another European interesting, I think, uh, institute, the EIT Health, also joining forces across borders, bringing together research, business, education in an effort to accelerate also their translation to clinical practice and use, supported by a, what we call a network plus plus, joining forces with all the uh, necessary stakeholders, really building on strength in a number of European countries, but reaching out across the whole of Europe, the European 27, with both co-location centers across Europe and a strong central organization that can put all the information together in order to uh, take a European wide view and again, address the uh, European 27 countries all. And so in summary, I think a comprehensive health research strategy requires um, a, a vision at European level across EU and bringing together the national the member states, the regions, uh, take guidance of widely supported goals like the uh, sustainability uh, development goals, the sustainable development goals and a commitment to one health because we are living on one planet and very importantly, integrate health research across prevention, public health and healthcare domains to ensure that the policies are coordinated that are based on really evidence-based research insights and primarily um, provided across borders and widely used. And therefore, very importantly, including all stakeholders in the priority setting as just uh, also uh, presented by Professor Xiaomian, a very important boundary condition to be successful. Having said that, I'm very happy to give the word to Professor Wiesler, the president of the Helmholtz Association of German Research Centers. I think um, a, a very good example, I emphasized more the implementation aspect, of course, well, extremely important to have a very sound scientific basis and I think the Helmholtz uh, Gesellschaft, uh, 15 centers throughout Germany, um, really bringing together the excellence across one country. What if we can uh, translate that, transfer that to a European wide level? And uh, Professor Wiesler, I'm happy that you can join us and that you can share your vision with all of us. May I give you the word? I am happy to join. Let me just load uh, this presentation from this one, right? Mm -hmm. This one? Yeah. Or, uh, oh, and then, um, instead of the lights, getting the oversight. Yeah. Okay. No. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, we see the presentation. It's an, however, but it's not, not it's not in presentation that. mode yet. Not in presentation mode. Yes. No. Okay. Let's see. Okay. At the bottom right, Professor. Oh, wow. at the bottom right. Yeah. Yes, that one. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, dear Hans, dear colleagues, um, uh, it's a pleasure to join this uh, inspiring session this afternoon. Uh, in this group, we don't have to talk about the relevance of uh, biomedical research. I think it uh, has never been as obvious as today with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. What I would like to discuss with you is how can we position the European research space as a major international player, uh, both in biomedical research and in uh, future uh, medicine? Um, now, the um, importance of this has been highlighted um, um, by, by the previous speakers already, I, I'd like to sort of simply um, make three points again. Uh, we are in an exciting area, uh, era where translation from the bench to the bedside is really possible and happening. Uh, number two, uh, given the uh, magnitude of the challenge in many areas of biomedical research, this is a clear candidate 
for trans-European cooperation and coordination. And number three, uh, there is an incredible international competition going on, particularly between the United States, China, and uh, hopefully Europe, um, which we must sort of master here. Um, uh, this is an area which clearly requires coordination and, and critical mass. Um, we, we must rely on interdisciplinary expertise. Uh, we must build bridges between um, cutting edge research and cutting edge medicine in a very close type of, of interaction. This is increasingly about recruiting significant patient cohorts and do translational and clinical uh, research in these cohorts. Uh, research infrastructure is sometimes a, a highly relevant aspect. Data management and, and exciting developments in e-health are another important topic to, to, to focus on here. Um, um, at the end of the day, what is really critical is smart, talented people. Uh, in this area. So this is also about positioning Europe as one of the most exciting environments for talents from all over the world. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, this is also an area where we need new ways of interaction between research on one hand uh, and industry on the other. And, and this should include additional stakeholders as well as, as has nicely been presented uh, in the case of the cancer mission. Now, there's interesting developments going on in many of our countries to sort of establish new structures for competitive uh, translational biomedical research. I'll just give you a few examples in Germany where we have a very strong research um, sort of um, arena with organizations such as the Max Planck Society, the Fraunhofer Society, or the Helmholtz Association on one hand, and uh, we have uh, a very strong and competitive university medicine as a partner on the other hand. Um, what has not been uh, highly developed in the past has been a, a very strong long-term cooperation uh, between these elements and, 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 and partners. Uh, and we have taken a lot of um, um, measures to um, significantly expand the exchange and the cooperation between uh, research on one hand and, and, and medicine uh, on the other. Uh, a first step has been to establish very strong translation centers at locations where uh, university medicine and, and Helmholtz are active on the same site or on the same campus uh, in, in many instances. Uh, the idea being that um, uh, if we can establish a close interaction between scientists and uh, clinical colleagues under one roof, uh, we can provide an entirely new setting for continuous uh, bench to bedside and bedside to bench uh, research and translation in a setting where not only scientists and physicians, but also patients meet daily on a regular basis. This is an exciting space for joint R&D. Uh, and this is a setting where you can really develop and implement new ideas um, for diagnosis therapy and prevention uh, in, in terms of an early clinical proof uh, of concept. And of course, this is also an interesting um, entry point for partners um, from industry. Um, the, the, one of the best examples is certainly this comprehensive cancer center in Heidelberg, the National Center for Tumor Diseases, which is among the leading comprehensive cancer centers, certainly in Europe, and has been one of the models uh, to implement this idea of uh, a joint sort of translation um, center between both worlds. Now, when we uh, established these centers and similar centers have been set up in other uh, European uh, countries, it became uh, obvious uh, early on that in many instances, we don't have critical mass for a given area at only one location. Um, uh, yet, um, at the national level, there is often five to ten major players in a given disease area who are internationally competitive 
and who would be ready to enter into a long-term type of uh, cooperation or, or interaction. Um, um, and based on the idea that you do need critical mass um, for translation in all major sort of biomedical um, areas, um, based on this observation that um, there is a lot of excellent research and a lot of excellent um, um, high-tech medicine, but uh, often um, scattered throughout the country. Um, um, we, we came up with this idea some 10 years ago to sort of um, establish very strong national consortia, which um, get the possibility for long-term institutional funding to join forces in um, 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 a translational uh, bench-to-bedside type of, of research. And uh, with uh, strong support from the federal government, uh, we managed to establish such national consortia in six major disease areas, um, uh, disease-driven. Uh, there is a national infection research activity now very active in the COVID um, sort of um, uh, environment. There is a national diabetes uh, center with seven locations throughout the country. There's a similar sort of structure in, 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 in lung disease. There's a new center for neurodegenerative uh, disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, with a major site in Bonn, and seven partners uh, distributed throughout the country. There's a similar structure in cardiovascular disease, and then and there's a very strong um, consortium uh, coordinated by the, by the German Cancer Research Center in the setting of a translational um, a cancer research uh, consortium. And um, um, this led us a couple of years ago in uh, discussions with Karin Sipido and, and many others in the context of um, uh, the scientific panel of health to consider the same idea at a European level. That is to set up very strong European consortia, which combine very strong, but also promising emerging partner locations in different uh, member states um, uh, to sort of bring us to a level where we are highly competitive in an international setting. Um, uh, the disease areas uh, are ba basically the same as the ones we already mentioned. I mean, cancer is already on its way with emission, uh, metabolic disorders with diabetes in particular would be a second example, infection, um, COVID-19 is, is, is no less than a wake-up call here uh, in, in this setting. Cardiovascular neurodegeneration, psychiatric disease is also a very important candidate because this is a major, major burden, uh, both for research and um, for, for, for medicine. Um, now, these consortia would have to sort of uh, establish um, um, first-class skills and expertise uh, in, 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 in a number of future areas. Uh, data management will be a, a, a key challenge, obviously. Um, Long-term goal will be to, to develop new ideas uh, for precision medicine all the way down to early clinical proof of concept. I think we must invest more into uh, um, prevention and, and get out of repair medicine more and more in, in the future. Uh, proof of concept ideas, which could be linked with IMI and similar structures are another uh, example. But outreach to patients is also very important. Uh, this could include uh, high-level patient information services and, and other um, 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 ideas um, as, as well. Um, an important aspect of each of these activities, in my view, uh, would be talent management, training and education to establish Europe as a real magnet for international talents in biomedical research and in innovative um, medicine. And this could be established as kind of a European junior biomedical Academy um, uh, and now is a very interesting time to attract talents to Europe with all the developments in the US, with all the trouble in the UK. I think uh, in, in continental Europe, we are very attractive for global talents, but we must act. Um, uh, in the setting of um, um, a, a cancer mission and Christine has introduced this very nicely, uh, one could of course 
um, sort of define a number of additional challenges. Uh, turning cancer into a chronic disease was one of our initial ideas that is already being implemented in the cancer mission. Um, significantly reduce all the problems with di for diabetes patients, secondary complications in, in, in particular. Uh, develop new strategies for chronic heart failure, the most important challenge in the cardiovascular field, for instance. Uh, we obviously need novel anti-infective agents and novel vaccines as well. And what we also need, uh, Hans has pointed this out very nicely, is something like a European digital health platform to sort of be uh, highly competitive in this critical future area. Uh, as well. And this should be something which involves all the major stakeholders in a given area, uh, of course, in a competitive sort of uh, procedure, uh, research centers, hospitals. Um, and this should also um, sort of be fitted into the European environment. That is, it should not only include the first class leading institutions, which must be essential members here, but we also should consider twinning and partnering uh, paradigms from the very beginning to sort of roll this out at the entire um, European level. Um, now, uh, you can consider quite a number of different governance models uh, for this. Uh, uh, I think what we need at the end of the day is a very flexible system for European health research consortia, uh, which could uh, be established uh, under the roof of a, um, um, a European um, a health research council, as proposed by Karin at the very beginning. Um, um, major disease areas would have to be defined. Um, the uh, contributions of from different partners, from different uh, member states are, of course, uh, highly flexible according to the disease area. The Cancer Core Europe sort of consortium of cancer centers could be one, one uh, potential model. And there must be overarching activities, a junior academy, a European e-health initiative, uh, um, smart selection and joint use of, of high-level research infrastructures, as well as new ideas for public-private partnerships, from which all these consortia at the end of the day uh, could, could benefit. So this would be um, the basic idea. It would be a very simple sort of mechanism to generate real added value. Uh, in Europe and make sure that Europe really evolves as one of the uh, major players in this uh, um, fearful competition with the United States uh, and China uh, in the years to come. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Otmar, and that uh, demonstrates, uh, I would say, that um, uh, you know, great insight can be based on proven experiences uh, and a German expanding to uh, to a European uh, level, I think, uh, very uh, well underpinned and wise uh, messages. Um, as the next, uh, I'll briefly share my screen again. We have two um, uh, interventions or contributions. That sounds maybe more positive from um, George Griffin and um, uh, Axel Pries. Um, can I ask George? Please take the floor. Hello, can you uh, can you join me in? I'm I'm on my video here. Yeah, we can uh, we can see you and uh, hear you loud and clear. Good. Hi, George. Good. Well, th uh, thank you very much uh, to Karen and Laurent for inviting me. The they asked me to talk about reflections. And first of all, I, I just want to say uh, the content of the meeting today has been absolutely unified. Uh, joining basic science, joining with clinical science, uh, training and all of the things that we know about. But how do we achieve that? And uh, I must applaud uh, Otmar's summary at the end as, as as you'll hear, as a, a potentially a great way uh, forward. 
Now, some general things, first of all, just to say that uh, I'm a, a biomedical scientist with experience in the UK and in the United States. Uh, I have carried on clinical medicine in infection, and so I'm very involved with COVID uh, with basic uh, research all the way through my uh, career. So it very much fits with Otmar's uh, idea, physician scientists. This is the way forward. In addition to that, I'm on the board of Public Health England because I wanted to extrapolate my science into public health for the benefit of, of the population. And I'm currently on one of the data monitoring boards of, the, of an mRNA vaccine for COVID from Imperial. Now, K Karen asked me to talk about two things which uh, I am very uh, associated with at the moment. One is the Federation of European Academies of Medicine what that's been doing and what the challenges are. And then a second group called SAPIR, which is a European group, and I'll explain what both of these are in a moment, uh, science advice for policy uh, from European academies. Now, one thing I must say, and I'm very apolitical, but I was delighted to see on Otmar's lovely summary slide, UK was mentioned because my own academy in London, uh, the UK Academy of Medical Sciences, is very, very, very anxious to maintain the strongest of links at biomedical science and clinical level with, with Europe. And anything that uh, we can do to facilitate that, uh, we, we will do. Now, first of all, what about FIM, Federation of European Academies of Medicine? For those of you not familiar with this, this is a group of academies of medicine from 22 different countries uh, covering principally human medicine, but recently we've invited veterinary science uh, from the French Academy and the Italian Academy to join. Uh, and uh, it ranges from uh, Romania uh, in, the, uh, in the East through to the UK with other countries of course, in the middle of that. We don't do research per se, but we provide a, uh, a base for giving scientific advice on clinical areas. So for example, uh, we have had symposia and produced a big report recently on transforming aging in the European Union, which will be used for uh, the new green paper which the EU is producing on what are the challenges with the aging population. We have looked at migrant health and how that is influencing uh, uh, the UK. But more recently we have become involved in research not at the wet bench level which is my own area but we have uh, we are one of the partners in Periscope and we will be looking at various aspects of, uh, of COVID uh, from uh, pandemic protection through to uh, ethical aspects of the, uh, uh, of the disease. And those of you, I'm sure there are some of you here who are in COVID already, uh, you will know that this is a very, very large project which will be reporting to the EU. Now, about uh, seven years ago, uh, Commissioner Moidas from Portugal set up a group called SAPIR. This was scientific advice from uh, European academies, and they would meet together uh, to issue statements and to issue advice on, on developments to the European Union. And this, in, in my view, has had some challenges. And one of the challenges, and this will be one of the recommendations I'm going to make at the end, is not to become too bureaucratic. That it must be led by clinicians and bioscientists uh, in the first instance and mustn't be overwhelmed by uh, bureaucracy. But Sapir has produced some very, very important 
uh, documents for the European Union. One on microplastics and how this is influencing uh, uh, the world and indeed health. Uh, another one on transforming aging, as I've mentioned to you already. And from the firm point of view, we are just beginning to look now at producing a document which will be talking about vaccination for the old population. And that is probably most of us listening today over uh, a certain age. And uh, we know, of course, everyone has a, a policy for childhood vaccination, but now we are getting vaccines for the older population. And I, I don't need to go through that uh, long list for you already, but throughout Europe, this is not properly understood. We don't yet understand the immune system of the aging population. So FEM and SAPIR already have been trying to uh, communicate well. They've been trying to produce important uh, documents. And it's been a great privilege for me as the president of FEM to be invited by Karen uh, to some of the meetings on producing a formal proper European Council for Health Research, uh, which will, in the view of FEM, uh, be a very, very good and a major step forward. Now, just in, in summary, why is this going to be important? Well, first of all, it will provide long term value. Uh, it will be cross disciplinary and will give added value because of that. Uh, as we've already heard from Otmar in his lovely summary slide, uh, the grand challenge, uh, and we can meet the grand challenge much, much better by being unified than by being separate. And obviously different countries and different institutions will have strengths, uh, but we can all come together with those strengths. Size, capacity for clinical trials, uh, will be greatly enhanced uh, by a, a unified health research body. One of the things that uh, we have been talking about in FIEM recently is to explore uh, new technologies in uh, cancer uh, diagnosis. And you, you probably all know about the uh, uh, finding of, of DNA uh, specific to certain cancers uh, identifiable in, in peripheral blood of cancer sufferers. The question that we would ask, is this going to be applicable as a good uh, 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 screening technique for cancer and producing answers very early, which we know are very important in, in cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. And we are engaged at the moment uh, with uh, trying to get a system going, which will be based uh, from FIM, uh, the, uh, the Cancer Research UK and the Cancer Prevention Unit in the University of Cambridge will be leading that for FIM. And that's just a, another example of how working together uh, really, really adds uh, value. And at the end of this, of course, from the European perspective is this work, will reduce inequalities through Europe. I've mentioned to you already, Romania to the UK as the spectrum of FIM. And we see in that, of course, great inequalities in uh, opportunities for acquiring healthcare, for actually doing research uh, and really proving that uh, healthcare is very, very important. It also means that uh, we can have joint training, we can have equipment which is shared and the same between countries to reduce these inequalities. So in summary, uh, all I can say is it's been a joy for me to listen to the, uh, uh, to the uh, pr presentation so far. A firm would certainly want to help and be part of that. And already we've strongly endorsed the idea of a, a council for health research in Europe. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Griffin, also for the uh, endorsement by a very uh, important uh, institute. 
Um, now move over to the last uh, uh, contributor, uh, Professor Priest, of uh, Dean of the uh, Charité uh, University Hospital. Yeah, thank, thank you very much and thank the organizers for this very uh, fascinating meeting. And I would like to give my comments also on behalf of the Biomed Alliance, uh, which has a European view on, on these issues. And I would like to address three relatively simple questions uh, regarding to the European Council for Health Research. A lot of has been said already, but I would like to focus a few more arguments on each of those. So first question is, why should we have it? The second question is, why can we be successful with it? And the third more most pertinent question is, why don't we have it? Um, with respect to the first one, George and Otmar and everyone else gave a lot of examples. Um, health challenges don't respect boundaries and we need a unified answer. It's, it's very clear with COVID obviously, but it's also true with heart failure and everything else. And the, un the only thing it does is it's increasing inequalities. Uh, health questions are devastating for our European effort to, to create a region with a common quality of life. And, and um, I think it, it's our responsibility to, to work together. And as it was said, such a council, um, why should we have it? We have um, a lot of structures on the European level and, and a lot of people who are extremely devoted to pushing Europe forward. But we need a less bureaucratic, more sustainable, a little bit less political and much more scientific. Body. And, and that's uh, why it's needed in addition to what we already have. It's not a proper discussion to say, um, why, why should we have something like this where we have all these initiatives um, uh, on the European level? There's something lacking and that's very obvious from all, our, uh, all your comments. So we should have it. I think that's a unite, united view here. The other question is why could it be successful? The fierce competition with the US and China and others was already mentioned. But I think Europe has a lot to give. Europe um, is notorious for its fragmentation, inequality, and di diversity. But on the other hand, this diversity brings a lot of ideas. Europe should also be notorious for creating much more ideas per square meter and, and hour than other areas in the world. And I think that's still true. We are strong if we are able to manage this diversity. We don't want to get rid of the diversity. Um, and and uh, when I talk about Europe, I think uh, about the geographical term of Europe, including Britain, obviously, and, and we need Britain in, in this. And uh, I, I think we need all of these different European viewpoints and they make us very strong. And, but they also um, put a high burden on our organizational skills. Um, it's like herding cats or fleas or whatever, but, but these uh, cats are very intelligent and very knowledgeable and very engaged cats. So if we manage to do it, uh, it would be a very, uh, successful entity and we would be even stronger as compared to how we are. And um, if you look at uh, your, uh, European conferences in medical fields, they are very strong. They are in very many fields, the biggest of the world. They attract most people from the world. So in terms of ideas, we are strong. We are a little bit weaker in terms of translation into real action. And, and that's what we have to, to learn. And so we, we, we should have it. We can be successful. So the, the most burning and uneasy question is why don't we have it? Otmar just said it's a relatively easy task. And, and Otmar, when you showed your graph, it's, it looks easy, but, but, but why don't we have it? The, um, the SPH, the Biomed Alliance the team and many other uh, um, stakeholders were, were advocating for it. But, but we are not getting it until now. And we have to learn from our failures and, and, and try to, to, to um, um, use different policies. So one thing is 
conflicting interests on different levels. Um, it's a commission, it's the, it's the, um, um, the, the council, it's a parliament, and each of them have different viewpoints. Europe is very complex and we need to, to um, encom encompass all the different viewpoints and, and liaise with all the relevant stakeholders. Um, it's also the very strong national science foundations and so on and so forth. And we, 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 we need to increase the communication about it. And if we were really convinced here in this group, I mean, we have people from industry, we have people from academia, we have uh, people from large national uh, science uh, uh, um, yeah, organizations. So why shouldn't we be able to enlarge it to the other players in this field, also from the patient side? So, so we should team together better and, and, and increase the communication. And then at the end, it's also a, a question with respect to leadership. So how can we have some, some group or whatever uh, spearheading this kind of, of effort to, to make it really visible on the European level? So the, the last question, why don't we have it? Obviously, I don't have an answer because <laughs> we, we weren't able to do it last time, but we, we should, should not be um, depressed about it. We should just stand up and try it again and, and say we need a firm um, kind of project where we want to have it implemented in the next round on the European level. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Priest, for your uh, well thought through uh, words and very wise words as well. I will uh, give the word back to uh, Karin and uh, Laurent. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to, to end uh, this wonderful presentations from all the, uh, everyone here. Uh, first of all, to summarize what, what the ideas were behind having this session and where to go from here. I think Axel said it very uh, pointedly, why don't we have it? What do we have to do more? I listed three items that I think we have to do more. We have seen in the presentations that there are lead examples. We have to grow bottom-up initiatives and keep demonstrating the power of uh, an approach that is more collaborative and that reaches cross border. We have to build stakeholder alliances. When we ask uh, for change, we have to come together, not in a competition, but in cooperation with a common goal. And in that, we also have to learn to talk with decision makers. I'm afraid we are not sufficiently trained. We talk about science then, but we need also to know how to communicate and get our ideas across. One question uh, that has come up in those discussions is, do we need a structure? Because there's a lot of ideas that, well, we have a lot that is already functioning. There are many, many structures. And my answer is, yes, we do need a structure. And I'll give uh, two reasons, or maybe three. We need a visible leadership. Again, where is the leadership for European health research and health in Europe? We need also, when we set our division and strategy, transparency. Who shall we talk to? And we need some, somebody, a body that is accountable. We need results and someone needs to be held responsible. So where should it be? I think at European level. It, uh, is the level that covers across many geographical and responsibilities, and it needs to be sufficiently independent. But I'd like to end before we uh, turn to the questions that are queuing in the box, a last uh, word from Susanna Talkonen. And I hope you can see the full screen because I don't, uh, but she wishes to emphasize the support and the commitment from the patients to a European Union for health across policies and with the leadership that it needs. In research, fragmentation and lack of priority setting and implementation coordination results in health inequalities, unnecessary suffering and waste of resources. And this is never more acute than now. 
The patients are not only waiting, they are ready to engage as stakeholders in expressing support for European Council for Health Research. With those final words, I'd like to open my Q&A box and there are a few questions and unfortunately we will not be able to answer them all. But the first uh, coming in that I'd like to address to, to Laurent because uh, he has been working at the uh, Haute Autorité de Santé and we have talked about implementation in health and in healthcare. But one of the questions there, of course, is how do we bring that together with the, um, the payers, with insurance, with governments, defining cost reimbursements? How do you see the collaboration in our initiatives with that uh, group who was not present in our discussion today? Laurent, can you comment on that? You have to uh, open your microphone. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. So the question is, uh, in, in Europe, we have two steps. Uh, the first step is uh, the market approval, and it is done at the European level, and uh, industry is present, and uh, industry and the regulators are present and discussing about the safety and efficacy of the, of the device, the drug, or procedures. It's mainly drugs today, but it could be extended to, to device and procedures. And the second step is reimbursement and pricing. And for that, uh, it's, uh, it's true that it, it's uh, at the member state level and not at European level. It is more uh, uh, re regulators or more the national insurance uh, who are present in order to uh, see if it is uh, uh, good for, for the population and could be reimbursed and at what price. So the, this question is uh, the, 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 the Industry is present, experts of industry are present, uh, but are confronted to the national insurance who made their market that so they, they wish or not wish to take this drug for, for their population. What I say that it's possible to have a common, a common uh, uh, research on the, the comparison, what we call comparison of effectiveness. That's true that we, European uh, Network of Health Technology Assessment and uh, Scientific Panel of Health uh, propose to have uh, a, a common assessment and uh, leave to, to the member states to take or not take, uh, 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 to take the, for reimbursement or not, but, but research of, and comparison could be together. And that is, all the stakeholders should be together in order to make this kind of comparison. If I can maybe add to that, uh, one other level is uh, that in uh, cost containment is that we need research that reduces ineffective treatments. And uh, that is something that industry will never take up and for which you need uh, a public funding in order to, to contain costs. And maybe one more is uh, an interesting initiative uh, currently uh, proposed by the Commission is a, a kind of BARDA-like structure where the European level steps in to negotiate development at a later stage and thereby also negotiating about costs and access to, to treatment. But Hans, maybe you want to, to add something to this discussion? I saw you not. No, I, I think I fully agree, Tim. We uh, really need to have the, the data to uh, to analyze the outcomes, in both in terms of what is effective, but also what is not effective, uh, following up also longer time. There was a, also a mention about um, focus on, on elderly. Yeah? So, so I think with digital technology, it will also be possible, like we're doing with uh, Vodan in the COVID-19 example, uh, to uh, follow up um, uh, really uh, longitudinally what... Uh, what happens with uh, with people, and that can be used to uh, to make better decisions and translate uh, more effectively and more supported by evidence and research into uh, clinical practice and applications. Maybe uh, I I oh sorry, George, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I, Hans's comment there is very very pertinent, and I, I must say when when we were producing this document transforming aging for europe um, it was very clear to us that 
uh, it must be evidence-based, which of course it, it was and was scientifically based, but we should not go into policy. And that policy was the province of the uh, commission and they would take the evidence and decide on policy. Now, I found that quite difficult and uh, I had to go through the document at the end to make sure that we didn't use the word policy anywhere. So this, this balance between scientific evidence, uh, which converts into uh, uh, research and converts into policy for healthcare, is quite a delicate one. And uh, again, uh, my comments were, keep things simple. Uh, uh, don't get too complicated is my experience from uh, uh, from this. Thank you very much, George. Um, we are ending the end of our session. Uh, it's near, but I'd like to to uh, to give a message also in the Q and A box that is not truly a question, but something important that we also experienced uh, during our work in the Scientific Panel of Health, where we had the opportunity to have many stakeholders around the table, is that we must be very careful to be too biomedical oriented. There is to health a lot more than just biomedical sciences. And we are really going into what I personally often call the age of humanities, the role of behavioral sciences, political and social interactions. We really need to be to think broader. And if we are going forward, which we are, to uh, go for a European Council for Health Research, it needs to be broad enough, multidisciplinary enough to come to better health for citizens. And perhaps with this, we can uh, end our session. Uh, anyone who has still unanswered questions in the box, please also feel free to contact us, panel members individually, or to me, through me, uh, to the panel. And uh, I want to also thank the World Health Summit for hosting this session again. And uh, we will make progress and see each other maybe next year. Thank you very much for attending, all to, so to all participants. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.